frustration from brutality with our black nation a reality this is my perspective it's my perspective my perspective my perspective my perspective my perspective my perspective this my perspective my perspective my perspective my perspective my perspective my perspective it's my perspective my perspective is my perspective Welcome to another episode of the New African's Perspective, the show that is dedicated to the liberation of new African people. I am your host, and every week I am blessed, I am honored to be joined by the President and Vice President of the Republic of New Africa, the powerful, the beautiful, the Black Tabulous, Mama Ayo, Free the Land, and Sister Sama Ats. No doubt, no doubt. And we are a part of something called the New African Independence Movement. So last week we talked about why we called ourselves New African. So we are part of the New African Independence Movement. So this week, why is independence what we're struggling for? Why is independence so important? <laughs> well, first of all, okay, let's, 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 let's keep it nice and clear. If you're in a bad relationship, right, because our relationship, New African people, black people's relationship with the U.S. empire is abusive. It's destructive. We've done everything to, quote unquote, be a part of this particular system and get uh, rights and be everything. And literally, why, why would you keep begging your oppressor for anything? Period anything exactly. period so you have a right a human birthright to independence you don't have to be subjected to to such and that's what we as a people need to to comprehend and understand and and value our lives a little bit better than having to um uh, put ourselves and our families and our generation after generation after generation in jeopardy no we have another option and our option is independence I totally agree with uh, Madam President because independence is going to be based on land, is going to be based on our particular culture, our particular value systems, our particular way in which we view the world. So independence, and it's very difficult for us to work in that particular paradigm when you're in an oppressive, white supremacist, imperialistic, colonial captive state. And that is exactly what every new African and indigenous person in America is. We're under those conditions. So independence, I think there is no other choice but to look at what independence looks like, uh, feels like, uh, starting with self, starting with self and then family, community, nation, and race. So independence is very, very, very important. We want to be free of something that does not mean us any good and has not since the day in which they came and touched on this land and took the indigenous land away and the day in which uh, a, a group of captives were, were set upon this land. I yield. No doubt, no doubt. Um, I mean, it's really going to be difficult to try to solve our problems when we're still dependent on the very same people who benefit from our exploitation to control the resources and systems that govern our lives. So it just doesn't make sense. So independence, the logical solution. But uh, Madam President, what we got on tap for the show today? Okay, so for today, of course, uh, in our cadre corner, we're going to be discussing uh, the new African creed. Mm -hmm. The new African creed. creed. The principles that we stand on. We're going to be discussing that. And also for our topic today, we are going to discuss is the sexism still exists within the new African independence movement. Oh, man. And like I'm in trouble on that I can't one. wait. <laughs> no, no, brother, you not in trouble. Other brothers may be in trouble. All right. Now, <laughs> in our Black Power File, we are going to celebrate in honor the infamous Queen Betty Shabazz. I say, I say, I say. But I guess uh, we, we should start out by uh, 
get into some of these hot topics. What's mm-hmm. been going on? Um, <sighs> Ahmad Arbery, y'all remember that brother? Yes. He was the brother who was murdered for jogging while black by two uh, white cockazoid um, <laughs> ran him down in a truck, shot him with a shotgun, videotaped it. Police saw the videotape, let him go on by their business. Uh, had it not been for somebody leaking the uh, video and all of the activity around the George Floyd uh, case, they would have just went about their business. But, you know, fortunately, someone did leak the, the video and now they're about to start their case. Interesting enough, mm. they have 12 jurors, and they're actually 11 white and only one black. Mm. One African juror. What y'all think about that? Hmm. It's not surprising. Not surprising at all. Because if we go back in history, in history, as many black men and women that have been murdered on this land, it's always like that. Either folks do time that doesn't belong to them in terms of black people, uh, white people not doing any any time at all. They just get to live their life, even if they um, uh, admit it to it to the crime. Somehow it gets looked over. So none of this is, is surprising. None of this is surprising. We discussed the, these topics just to, to make it be known in real time what we're dealing with. In terms of our oppressor, in terms of our direct enemy. Well, I think of this as just an example of uh, a modern day black codes mm-hmm. dealing with modern day lynchings. Mm-hmm. We will not call them murders. We will not call them assassinations. They're lynchings that have never stopped since uh, this particular system has uh, allowed it, has mm-hmm. perpetuated it, has has uh, you know promoted it. And interestingly enough, brother prophecy, remember. Where we get that word picnic from? <laughs> picnic. Just wanted to remind our Pick a audience. Nigga. Yes, and we have pictures where they would mm. pick someone at being lynched, and white men, women, and children were there eating while they're sitting there watching someone burn, have their genitals cut off, stuck stuffed in there in in their mouths, and they're laughing. They're laughing. It's as if it was something they they expected. And so this is, uh, in my mind, I related to, you know, this young man's murder because he was just jogging. He was just jogging. And, you know, we run. You know, you get into that mode where you're running and you just on that, on that, 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 that high. And then um, somebody's going to stop you. You have to talk to them. And then you end up murdered because you want to run. You want to be uh, fit. And then you have the nerve which this system does because of the black lo- black codes that are inherent in all of our laws in every city. Just because it happened in the South does not mean it's not perpetuated because it's systemic. And no one wanted to touch the case. No voice, no voice for the voiceless. It's still a perpetuation of an un- unjust system under the guises of capitalism, imperialism, white supremacy. Definitely, definitely. Um... Yeah, um, you you brought up lynchings and a lot of the um, things that went went with lynching because a lot of people don't understand lynching was actually a social event for white America, especially for poor whites. It was it was something that kind of united them and bonded them together. If you look up some of these um, pictures of of lynchings because they actually they took pictures of it and they used them as postcards and sent them through the mail of a human being being brutally murdered and them taking pictures but if you notice on a lot a lot of these pictures they're in uh white shirts khaki pants or dress pants ties suit and ties that's because a lot of lynchings happened on sundays and whenever there was a lynching it was advertised in the newspaper and they would actually let church out early so everybody could attend the lynchings that's why they were dressed that way so i mean it's kind of interesting that you know we had these good old christian folks who so good that they let their people out of church early so they could see a human being be brutally murdered in many cases that black person black man woman or child was being why they were being uh, tortured they were crying out for this white jesus in which they gave them they self. 
So just something to think about. But yeah, mm-hmm. uh, still the same thing. And, and just like we said before, it, why are we going to keep on begging uh, our oppressor to change his ways? Mm-hmm. It, he's already let us know that that's not what he, he plans or intended on doing. They won't even uh, give us an anti-lynching bill. Exactly. You know? Uh, and speaking of them not giving us an anti-lynching bill. So y'all remember a few weeks ago, we did a show where we asked the question, were the white liberals really our friend? Oh, yes. Yeah, and we kind of, you know, look, we, we looked at all these white liberals, which are in power right now, and all of these promises that these white liberals made us, so far we've seen... Um, no George Floyd bill, no anti-lynching bill. Uh, forget about some study in reparations. Our reparations is just a no-go. Matter of fact, I think Joe Biden said, "No, we want to get do something for everybody." You know. Um, <laughs> interesting enough, last week there was a story that came out in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, which basically said that the Biden administration was in talks to give reparations. Four hundred fifty thousand dollars per person who uh, had their family members separated at the border due to the um, what's his name Donald Trump administration from his policies. Exactly. Uh, since then, he they've walked that back. But Biden is on record of saying that they need some uh, monetary compensation. Uh, as well as a path to stay in the country. Now, I'm, I'm not mad at the people trying to come up here because I do think they should be compensated. But they specifically told us, black people, can't do nothing for just black people. We got to do something for everybody. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. they trying to give the immigrants uh, who were separated reparations. They gave the Afghanis so many, like $55 million dollars. Uh, they uh, gave the LGBT their own, you know, uh, anti-hate bill. They gave the Asians an uh, anti-hate bill. Exactly. Yeah, over being discriminated from COVID for one year. Exactly. But yet they keep on telling black people, well, we got to do something for everybody. What, what y'all think about it? I think it's a prime example of uh, white supremacy and capitalism because you've taken a group of people against international law, against laws of humankind, and you've turned them into your uh, beasts of burden, and you do not want to compensate it once they begin to rise up and speak out and to shine despite the atrocities on every single level. And I think that all black people in America, whether you're conscious or you unconscious, you know what your ancestors went through what had to happen and if you don't know what they went through then I suggest that that's a conversation over Sunday dinner Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday Friday, Saturday dinner to make sure that your children's children's children never forget so it's a prime example that uh, we're not begging for reparations we are demanding reparations because you know what you did we have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of records historical documentations, the whole Schomburg Library. We have museums upon museums. And we have us, the descendants of enslaved Africans. And, you know, what is, first of all, if we really think about reparations for, for black people, the descendants of enslaved Africans and enslaved indigenous, they don't open that conversation because they got to give up everything. Okay, that's a conversation they want to a whole a hundred percent avoid because let's be honest, if we open up a conversation of reparations, there is no monetary value that can can repair generations lost, gone, period, wiped out totally. There is no reparations in turn of monetary value that can 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 repair the fact that you are on somebody, you haven't crouched on somebody else's land. You don't belong here. You have to go. That is repairing. You got to give up land. You got to, huh? You got to give up everything you got and, and everything that your children's 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 children uh, benefit from. So that's the reason why that conversation does open. Because if we talk about reparations for real, y'all got to go back to the Caucus Mountains. Oh. <laughs> oh. 
Oh. Punched, punched him right in the Caucasoid Mountains. <laughs> Low blow. Oh. <laughs> but uh, definitely, um, I mean, what, what really gets me is black people, we, we tend to get caught up in this ideological struggle between these two competing European forces, white forces. And that's a Democrat, Republican, liberal, and conservative. Mm -hmm. Both of them want the same thing. Neither one of them give a damn about us. It's just that the Democrats realize that they can use black people as a pawn in order to progress their movement. Absolutely. And they've been going through this system called benign neglect. Where they will talk a good talk. They'll get all that good black stuff. Sometimes I used to hear Hillary Clinton and she talk about systemic racism and all this. I was like, you know what? She sound kind of good. Sound kind of good. Mm -hmm. But uh, what you actually do, what your actions are, don't match up with your words. Yeah. So I think it's, it's really time for us to wake up and hopefully now you see. That you got the big bad say Donald Trump out of office and you put the big bad devil into the office. <laughs> did you know it's really not a difference? So we got to stop playing their Democrat Republican game and start playing our game. Our game of independence, land and self-determination. You know? and, you, and you mentioned the Donald Trumps and the Joe Bidens. Donald Trump was at least honest. He exactly. said, we're getting ready to make this country great again. And that was very blatant, and it was a very strong message, and he tried his best to uphold that message. Uh, other folks is undercover, behind the scenes, down low with it. Just be honest that you are, you, you are upholding a system. We don't care what is getting ready to happen. Gentrification is the order of the day. All black lands, farms, uh, inner cities are under attack. Let's 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 be clear, and which which means that if we are clear about that message, we as black people, wherever we are, need to should be doing and are doing little bitty things to help reunite the community, make sure that the community is safe, make sure the women, children and elders are being upheld, because who else is going to protect us and you except ourselves? And, you, you know, one of our major things as new African people, our major responsibility is to stop participating. OK, we can, we have to stop participating in all of this foolishness and nonsense within this particular system. It, it Come on. Come on now. Mm. Because we know the truth and we see the truth and we live the truth. It, at some point, we have to say enough is enough. We have to take those necessary steps, y'all. There is no nothing. There ain't there, no no. Jesus is not coming to save you. <laughs> you know you got to be Jesus. You know yeah, you read them stories. Jesus was a revolutionary. Sure. Period. And so if you walk in the way in the, of of Christ, <laughs> you supposed to be turning over tables. All right. You, you, one you, by you, one. You don't. Mm. <laughs> you don't subscribe to this. This is not. This is not the most high way. This Definitely. is not nature's way. This is not your way. And you begging, we've been, huh? We see that that does absolutely nothing. How long, oh Lord, how long? We got to stop with the foolishness. Been waiting on Jesus for 2,000 years. <laughs> how long, oh Lord? That's a long ass time, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let me stop. We uh we got a cadre corner. <laughs> People gonna be mad. You gonna go to hell? But uh anyway, um, <laughs> it's in love and righteousness we speak these words. Or definitely, definitely. <laughs> but uh we got a cadre corner come up. What we gonna what we gonna be talking about in this cadre corner? The cadre corner is, I think, one of the most prolific pieces of document. Uh, which is embedded, of course, within the Declaration of Independence of the Republic of New Africa. And, it is, and we call it the New African Creed. And when we talk about the New African Creed, we're talking about about 15 different points, or I say affirmations, I'll say affirmations. Um, that, that, Don't give it away already. Okay. <laughs> you're just ready to get started. <laughs> but you're gonna hear you're going to hear the rest of that when we come back right after this at the New African Perspective, Free the Land. I am, I will, by any and all means necessary. We will win the war. Imagine your life with no trauma. You live with no trauma. Your chest got more cum. Live in our own. We all know the problems. 
We can see them. We can feel them. They're all around us. But aren't you tired of just talking about the problem? Let's talk about the solution. Free the lands. Join us for New African Nation Day 54, March 25th through 27th, 2022, in Birmingham, Alabama. Free the land. Study the writings, speeches, documents of our freedom fighters in order to free our neo-colonialized minds. This is the Cadre Corner. So today we're going to be talking about the New African Creed, which is housed within the uh, Code of Umoja, our Declaration of Independence. And this document, to me, it's held in very, very high esteem. It rates the 42 uh, laws of Ma'at, the, the Nguzo Saba, the Ten Commandments, because it acts as a code of behavior. It acts as a method in which we can incorporate these particular principles into our lives and to implement them on a daily basis, as well as memorize them as new Africans, because that is what we're trying to uh, do with ourselves. So, of course, the creed starts off with, I believe in the spirituality, humanity, and genius of black people, and in our renewed pursuit of these values. So right from the beginning, our African ancestors, in which we stand on, believe in the spirit of who we are, that we are, hu we, we are the beginnings of humanity. And of course, our genius is unprecedented, even though we were an enslaved people here in America. We talk about, uh, in the second, Point, and there are 15 in all, uh, that I believe in the family and in the community and in the community as a family, which takes us from that individualistic tendency to a more con communalistic uh, paradigm in which we need to operate. I believe that the community is more important than the individual. So it goes on to guide our lives. And of course, my favorite is number eight. I believe in the Malcolm X doctrine that we must organize upon this land and hold a plebiscite and to, the, to tell the world by vote that we are free and our land independent. And after the vote, we must stand ready to defend ourselves, establishing our nation beyond contradiction. I hope I said that correctly because I am in the process of memorizing all of them. But that tells us exactly what our plan is. We believe that we have the right to be here we're going to ask our people to give us, by vote, the, 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 uh, the, the charge to go ahead and declare ourselves independent. And then, of course, being ready, of course, based on history and what we've done in this country, to defend ourselves. And we like to, as New Africans, whenever we have meetings, to start with this creed to set our intentions, to honor those founding mothers and fathers. And at the end of the 15 points, we say, we, we say to ourselves that we will do what? Now freely and of my own will, I pledge this creed for the sake of freedom for my people and a better world on pain of disgrace and banishment if I prove false. That's powerful because some of us are not real new Africans and our tendencies are suspect. And for I am no longer deaf, dumb, or blind. I am by the inspiration of our ancestors and by the grace of our creator, a new African. Free the land, free the land, free the land. And that is the new African creed. Extremely important document. Um, valuable, valuable information. Where can we get this document? Well, it's in, it's probably going to be on our website, which of course is www.pg-rna.com. And you just uh, go in, log in, create your account, and you will have exposure to many of the founding documents, including, of course, the Code of Ramosia, um, the Creed, all kinds of things, the Declaration of Independence, the preamble, on and on and on. And there's a lot more on there. And every day, more and more are being loaded up. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. So make sure you all check that out. Uh, 
Which brings us to our topic of the day. And I know these queens been waiting on this topic. I'm like, Ooh. but uh, uh, so we in the new African independence movement, movement, black nationalist movement, the uh, black liberation movement throughout the years. Um, and this, this is something, you know, interesting to me because it comes from a different perspective from mine. So I'm really going to be leaning on you all to enlighten me on this issue. So we had a question about sexism. Mm -hmm. Yes. Does sexism exist in the new African independence movement? Come on, brothers. Tell me it's not true. But I, I'm, I'm going to open it up to the queens. It most definitely still exists. It's not supposed to, according to our new African uh, Declaration of Independence. Yet, it still exists because from the basic fact that we are a colonized people and we have uh, taken on the ways of our oppressors. See, because white men oppress white, white women, historically known. That's a known fact. In many a different way, it take a white woman to tell you specifics, right? They tell you. Um, and And brothers have taken on the way of white men and sisters have taken on the way of white women because white women will also tell you because they've been oppressed they've um been become emotional manipulative and all types of different things right this is the way that they operate so we have taken on their ways yet coming into the new african independence movement and you saying i am a conscious new african citizen you're shedding old ways and you're, you're taking on um, the principles of the new African creed. Absolutely. You're taking on that which you're taking on the code of emotion. You're taking on the laws of Ma'at. These are, this is what we are living by. We are realigning, realigning ourselves with nature, our natural way, our birthright, realigning ourselves exactly. with who and what we are on the planet. And we're not that we're not sexist in our traditional culture. We respect people based upon their capability, based upon their gifts and their talents, and those things are nurtured. So we don't suppress uh, people's abilities within our culture. That We just don't do that. Exactly. And um, one of the things that I, I know that um, the aims of the revolution, uh, of, the, of course, the Code of Umoja says we will not be discriminatory. Uh, between the sexes. There will not be discrimination. There will not be that between the sexes. And because, again, and since we have no other model, we have taken on what is supposed to be female and what is supposed to be women and what are supposed to be men and fathers in, in, in a Eurocentric paradigm. We're saying, what does that look like when we say that we are new African and we're coming from a uh, African centered perspective, particularly when we're saying that we're trying to free the land, build family, uh, protect the community, our women, and then use our genius, every skill that we've been gifted with to the service of the race. And oftentimes we will um, have a little, we will have attitudes when you find that um, women, females, sisters have natural leadership abilities. Well, why shouldn't we? There are the Ya Santawas, the Nani Maroons, there are the Saroya Mongo, there's the, of course, there are, uh, there's the Queen Mother Moors, there are the Mama uh, uh, Daras, there are all, all sorts of people, Winnie Mandela's, so on and so forth. Why wouldn't we? We've, we, he, we are here in a, as a captive people and we've had to uh, build all of these skills on multiple levels to survive, to keep our families, to do, to live without our our brothers, uncles, and fathers at our side because of this system, and we are natural leaders because we multitask on many levels. And in many cases, when the brothers have beautiful ideas, uh, who do you see standing behind them? Who do you see working with them? Who do you see making visions come into fruition? Mm -hmm. And it is painful when you see attitudes and, and ways that are distributed that show that they are patriarchal, not only sexist, but patriarchal. So that says you're coming from a different mindset. So those are some of the things that we have uh, 
noticed and are bearing witness. Okay. Uh, he smiling like, what are you going to say? <laughs> what you going to say, huh, no, brother? Brother? I love you, your brothers address this. Like real men address uh, this. You know what I'm saying? No. Um, okay. Uh, I think one thing that we have to always strive for is the objective reality. And if you don't know what objective reality is, that means the truth, not your opinion, not your perspective, not your point of view, but the actual truth, that which exists outside of your opinion and your perspective and your belief. And the objective reality, as far as black people, African people, new African people, melanated people globally, we have been colonized, exactly. not only physically, but mentally. Mm -hmm. So not only do we have to break the physical chains of colonization, we got to break the mental chains of colonization. In order to do that, we got to look at all of these things, all of these characteristics, all of these aspects that have been placed upon us by our European colonizers. And that includes behavior, um, um, diet, yes. and mentality, mindsets, exactly. and sexism, uh, how we deal with each other between uh, uh, male and female, man and woman, God and goddess, is an important thing that we have to reconnect with our African tradition. Because like you said, historically, there was a myotic balance between man and woman. If you understand the dialectical uh, unity and struggle of opposites, you cannot have a up without a down. You not you not have a left without a right. And you cannot have a man without a woman. You can't have a god without a goddess. You know. You can get into the religious origins of sexism, you know, want to, but that's a, that's another that's another conversation. That's a little deeper conversation. It is. But um, when you look at the objective reality of our historical reality here in America, from the beginning of this system of colonization of enslavement, the black man has been brutally attacked. Absolutely. And you have to understand. Due to the necessity of our situation, the black woman has been forced mm -hmm. to become one of the strongest creatures on the planet. Absolutely. That's that's a reality that we got to acknowledge, that we got to recognize. When many times when our people were being brutalized, when the men were being brutalized, lynched, and the women too, but, but the men were especially targeted. Yes, they were. The women have held it down. Had it not been for the strong, the strength of the black woman, we might not have probably would not have made it this far. Yes. So, you know, we ought to take a serious look in the mirror and understand our true objective reality, the real situation, because you can't just over. I mean, I, it, it's, 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 this is a crazy subject for me because I never I always look at individuals and say, can this individual do what's needed? Uh, are, are they lacking in some things? And trust me, uh, I know many women who be on point. Well, a lot of brothers not. So it, you know, in my mind, it's, it's, it's not. It's not a question of you can't do this because you're a woman, or you got to be put in this position because you are a woman. Uh, so, absolutely. And it, it, it's very interesting, uh, brother prophecy, because you you can actually see brothers and their queens. Um, those who are operating in harmony with one another, particularly now when I'm, I'm not talking about the general masses. I'm talking about we are trying to build families in the new African independence movement. Our families, we want them to be happy, healthy. They're going to eventually create clans. Clans are going to be united and we're because we're trying to build a new African society. So when we bring a lot of the isms and schisms into new Africa, that's more time that has to be put aside to the shaking or shedding of these tendencies that we are inheriting from being neo-colonialized captive mm -hmm. citizens. So we're asking uh, sisters and brothers, we're not feminists. We are new African 
freedom fighters, revolutionary freedom fighters. And revolution doesn't mean necessarily just the military, although it includes military. It means on every level, mm -hmm. from cooking to exercise, to your spirituality, to your diet, to your mating habits, courtship habits, all of that being transformed. And when we say this, we mean it sincerely. We are, we are creating something that the world has never seen. And it starts with, the, with us. Yes, we're literally recreating culture. This is universal law and order science. We have to get back to who we are as a people. We have always respected the life principle, the unk principle, life, the unk science. This is how, how we have, were able to create these beautiful, massive empires all across on every indigenous land. Exactly. We were able to do that because we, of the respect of divine masculine and divine feminine coming together and respecting those particular qualities that masculine energy has and feminine energy has, has and knowing how important and how necessary and how vital these the, the the energy is you know so it's a, it's a matter of respecting one another loving one another respecting one another and knowing that it takes it takes these two energies to come together to build anything yes exactly uh y'all made some really really good points and i just add a little bit to that uh because a few weeks ago matter of fact i think our last show we talked about an African value system versus mm -hmm. a European mm -hmm. value system. Mm -hmm. And it's important that, that that topic is so important, especially even when we're talking about in, in all aspects yes. of human activity. Uh, because like right now, when you look at, there are a lot of movements out now. There are a lot of feminist movement. And I'm glad you clarified, not feminist. No, you not. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. By definition, feminist is great. But by the, what the movement is, is a whole different story because you have a whole European mindset over that. And there are all kind of other movements that attack the, the traditional what a man is and what a woman is and that whole myotic balance. Yes, exactly. You know, it's like being a man, period. And this is not, you know, what we're talking about right now, but being a man, period, is being under attack. Yes. Being masculine, period, is being under attack. You know, I understand about uh, sexism and male chauvinism and stuff like that. But I mean, it's a whole different thing to label masculinity is toxic. Masculinity is not toxic. It can never be. No. Masculinity is needed. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We Absolutely. need that balance. So it's really important that we look at everything from an African perspective, a new African perspective, and don't just take on these labels and ways of these European people who have distorted reality in order to gain a progression of their own per uh, personal movement that does not benefit us. Exactly. We have to do things that benefit us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, I yield on that. I say. I say. So that's what we're talking about. Yes, it still exists. Are we working on sexism within the new African independent movement? No doubt. I mean, even uh, Asada wrote about it in her book. Mm -hmm. So we know it exists. We, we talk to uh, women all the time who are in the new African independence movement, in the black power movement, in the black liberation movement, in the new African independence movement. So we know that it exists and we know that we're still going to be a part of uh, this freedom fighting that we're doing. Uh, I think one of the, the best things and the most heartening uh, realities that I was exposed to is that there are a lot of political prisoners and uh, POWs who voice all the time how important it is for uh, us to honor our women because they've had that time and that time to study and to meditate and to go deep within and to know that at, when they come out as liberated uh, citizens, um, their attitude towards women, their love for women and children and elders uh, is, has been transformed. Yes, and it's, it's just really, really, really important that we do this work thoroughly and, and really, really pay close attention and be willing to do the self-analysis, the self, uh, constructive self-criticism and the constructive criticism in our environments because this cannot exist. We have to do away with it. So whenever we see it, sometimes it can be very outright 
and sometimes this it can be um kind of covert and passive aggressive mm -hmm. so just just pay attention pay attention it's our responsibility to nip it in the bud definitely definitely like i said uh due to our conditions and our objective reality in this country the black man i mean the black woman has become strong always been beautiful always been powerful and sometimes as a black man especially because we've been so under attack a lot of us haven't developed that background that backbone to deal with a strong black woman that's so that's the reason why a lot of y'all go with them becky with the you, you know what i'm saying y'all know what I, you know what i said on that anyway <laughs> but um our sisters need us. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Uh, we need them. We need y'all. Yes. We need each other. Because the foundation of the black nation is, is the black man. And the black The black woman. woman the black which produces the black child. I say. No doubt. I say. I say. And with that, we got a powerful black woman I say. on our black power files. <laughs> Sister Betty Shabazz. Yes. Coming up right after this. I Free the land. I'm not your enemy, you my infinity Black man, woman, and child, we be the trinity And when I got you by my side, they cannot limit me Girl, it's us against the world, we got the remedy Fight through all the pain, been through all the struggle Europeans murdered 98% of the indigenous population right here in Turtle Island In order to steal the land An entire nation of African people were captured enforced into a brutal system of chattel slavery just so they could work and cultivate the land. All wars are fought over land, not over terrorism, not over religion, not even to win the hearts and minds of the people, but for the actual land and the resources within the land. So it is safe to say that land is the foundation to all freedom. So if we truly want to be free, then our struggle is for land. Free the land. Leaders, Leaders. scholars, Freedom fighters, all those soldiers who've been struggling for the liberation of black people. This is the Black Power Five. But we live in a society where a lot of abuses have taken place. A lot of people have been oppressed. And you will have to unscrabble that. It is extremely important then that you understand that you have a job to do. Not only of thinking critically, but of thinking clearly. Of understanding that I have as much right to live a holistic life as anyone else. And yet when we go to the prisons, and yet when we go to certain neighborhoods, and yet when we go to certain corporate places, we find very few people there look as if we are still in America. Destabilization is not just in our homes, as a lot of people try to say, but destabilization is in our communities, in the cities, and states, and the entire world. We must be concerned with the welfare of our people in a changing society. We must understand then that we must gain control, if not our communities, ourselves. And that was the strong, the beautiful, powerful Sister Betty Shabazz, uh, the widow of the great Malcolm X, which we did uh, Black Power File on last week. Uh, yes. But uh, what, what y'all think about this, sister? First of all, she's quite amazing because 
well, from what we know from her in terms of the, the new African independence movement, she continued the work of her husband after he had passed because she was one of the our, one of our first uh, uh, vice presidents mm -hmm. of the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa within the government. Yes. So she continued that work. She took it extremely serious, uh, continuing the legacy that her and her husband were building together for their children and for just new African people in general. Absolutely. She was, um, I just think that she was his, his mate uh, in, in all ways. They had six children together. Uh, they met while they were in the Nation of Islam. She was, she was there from, from the beginning. Of course, um, she continued, as uh, Madam President said, she continued because after he was assassinated in front of her face, mm. she did have a lot of uh, nightmares at first. And, it, and she took that journey that he took previously to Mecca. So she came back al Hajia. Um, so she, uh, she gained a lot more perspective because she had to go and heal. She had to do that and then she had to carry on from whence uh, Malcolm left off because Malcolm didn't amass thousands and millions of dollars. They were penniless and they had, she had to provide a home for these, these children who were devastated as well. Um, and so she continued her education. She kept her connection with uh, Medgar Evers' wife and uh, Martin Luther King's wife. They actually helped raise money to put her in a home, put her in a home in New York. And uh, she was able to continue her education. She became a PhD and she carried on the mission, you know, giving of herself, volunteering, but always, always, in my opinion, uh, being an activist. And unfortunately, you know, we will never know the real story. Uh, she, she, she had to, to uh, she was burnt up in a fire and uh, perished after some of those injuries. Mm -hmm. And we won't know, you know, the rest of that story because of course her grandson was also, uh, interestingly enough, uh, murdered mm -hmm. many years later. Mm -hmm. uh, when, I, when I think about Sister Betty Shabazz, Queen Betty Shabazz. Um, a lot of times we, we use words lightly. We just kind of throw them out. We say, I'm a revolutionary. I'm a freedom fighter. You know, I'm a, I'm a liberator of our people. But we don't really understand what that really means. The type of sacrifice you have to make in order to be that, not just say you're that, but to actually be that. Mm -hmm. Brother Malcolm was that and more. But being that means that you leave behind a wife or children that got to be hella strong in order to hold it together. Because just being connected with an individual like that, you're going to catch hell coming your way. And a lot of time because he is who he is, he's there liberating or uh, being there for the people. And what, what you don't realize is people like that in many cases are not able to be there for their own families because of the very nature of their work. It's exactly. something you just got to accept when you say, I want to liberate my people. Exactly. You just got to deal with it. There's a lot of hard pills you got to sw uh, swallow if you say you serious about the business of liberating your people. It ain't fun. Anybody who's doing this for the glory, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Exactly. So we got to hold up individuals like that because you will never we we know you know what malcolm went through we seen malcolm is well documented but we will never know the struggles in which that sister went through we will never truly understand how strong that sister had to be in order to endure and be there Absolutely. and hold up malcolm like she did so mm. i mean we gotta you know you imagine sitting at her feet <laughs> with them stories all the dynamics imagine all the dynamics that go on in your day just one day so putting ourselves in, back in that time and that that time frame all the different dynamics <laughs> like you said you will never know we will never <laughs> know we know that um uh she was able to to 
to get a few of the proceeds from the autobiography of Malcolm X. She helped write it along with, uh, of course, um, the brother who wrote Roots. Alex Haley. Alex Haley. And surprisingly enough, it, it states that once Alex Haley wrote his book, Roots, uh, she was taking 50% of the royalties. He just deeded over all the royalties for Malcolm X's book to help sustain. So um, we, we, we give thanks for anybody who helped her navigate through in those early years because it took a moment for her to get her education and to take herself from just being a nurse to a Ph.D. teaching at a school, etc., etc. And, and again, she, did, she never stopped being an advocate in the community, never stopped uh, being on commissions, never stopped in her organizing skills. Never. She never stopped. So uh, it, it, it may have, uh, you know how they say you can kill the messenger, but you cannot kill the message. She definitely carried on because she knew intimately what um, Malcolm's visions and his dreams and his fears were. And um, for me, interestingly enough, uh, we know that uh, Malcolm honored her in the best way that he could, that there have never been reports of her, of him um, having affairs or this. That was his love. That was who he was committed to. So, uh, so we, we, Queen Warrior, you know, you know, Queen Warrior, Betty Shabazz. And trust me, if Malcolm was out there like that, we would have known because the FBI of uh, surveillance and had taps on all of our leaders and mm -hmm. they the only thing they said about brother Malcolm was this brother is a saint especially compared to Dr. King nothing disrespectful to, to Dr. King but you know they just this you know he he he, he stayed loyal to that sister mm -hmm. you know and it was just a it's a beautiful thing when you have, you know, that black man and that black woman in unison on the same page working toward a common goal. It's nothing we can't accomplish. Exemplify, exemplifying high moral character. That's what our code says, that we must exemplify high moral character. And exactly. they were most definitely the epitome of that, exemplifying high moral character. So no matter what happens, when you are standing on principle, no matter what happens, you're gonna your reputation is going to be strong. It's going to be upheld forever to come, as we can see. These people was dedicated to what they, with the principles that they stood on, and they will live forever. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. Well. Well done, Mama. Well done. Definitely, I say. Um, I think we did it again. Another successful program. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Exciting. Yeah. Exciting. <laughs> exciting. So, you know, join us next week. Mm -hmm. um, I am your host, Brother Prophecy. I am with the president and vice president of uh, Mama Ayo Deli and Sister Sama Ott. Madam President, Sister Saima Ott, signing off. Free the you know, lane. No 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 education, the lies that be fooling no me. No Uncle Tom sell out coons, no buffoonery. Yeah. Eliminate the cruelty, just plenty of opportunity. No killing each other, it's just peace between you and me. This is how we do with our own black nation. Fight for land, independence, nationhood, reparations.